Hey, welcome everybody to our uh, GLREA Thursday evening Zoom. Uh, I'm John Sarver. I'm going to be your host tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the State Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, EGLE. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Harvest Solar, Homeland Solar, and Tree Energy. And I know a lot of you are, are members of GLREA, and maybe most of you are, maybe you all. But if you're not, we, we would love to have you join. Uh, and, you know, it's easily done on our website, uh, glrea.org. Uh, if you go there, you'll be able to punch some buttons and uh, be able to kind of uh, uh, join online. And so we'd love to have you join us. Uh, tonight, I think we've got a real interesting presentation. Uh, you know, a lot of times we do uh, residential. Tonight, we'll be talking about an apartment complex in Kalamazoo. Jason Menuz is the lead developer for Edison Community Partners, uh, which is working with Mount Zion Baptist Church in Kalamazoo on a legacy senior living project, which is going to be probably the most energy efficient complex, uh, apartment complex in the country. And they, they're in the process of getting a whole bunch of variety of green certifications. And uh, it's gonna be fully electric building and they're gonna have 300 kilowatts on site. And so uh, please mute yourself and uh, you know we'll be able to have uh, questions and comments after Jason makes his presentation. So uh, go ahead, Jason. Hey, everybody. One, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Jason Munez. I am going to get my presentation teed up here. And I apologize. I'm working off of a laptop today, so I don't have multiple screens going. So I kind of have to do everything one thing at a time. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yep. All right. Um, thank you for the introduction, John. My name is Jason Munez. I am a partner and senior developer with Edison Community Partners. Uh, we are a multifamily developer based in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We, we primarily work within the state of Michigan, and we specialize in the development of, of affordable housing um, aimed at, at residents who, who generally earn at or below about 60% of, of what we call their area median income. Um, and when I got into this industry, I thought, there's no way I want to do that. I, I have no interest in being a slumlord because I thought that's what affordable housing meant. And then um, you know, Joe Hollander, my, my business partner, Matt Hollander's father, kind of showed me around his portfolio and, and showed me what he had done with his career. And I realized that that our job was not to, not to be slumlords, but rather to, to put slumlords out of business and, and that we really had an opportunity to, to do something. Um, I hesitate to use the word good because... We're, we're building buildings and, and from from a sustainability perspective, I think they're just about all bad, but but we could do something a little less bad. And so um, together with Matt, um, that's kind of been our our passion and, and drive in, into everything that we do. So, you know, we're really focused on affordability for our, our residents. And currently we have um, we've developed about 2000 units uh, around the state of Michigan. And um, then we're, we're really focused on sustainability within our portfolio as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this slide is a project called Alpine House. It's, it's located in Gaylord, Michigan, and it was constructed in 2010, 2011. And this was kind of our first, first foray into, into solar there. And you can see that, that little array. Um, honestly, I don't remember the size on, on that one, but it's, it's um, given the age and the size of the, the apartment community, it was, uh, you know, relatively small percentage of, of the electricity that, that is used on the site was offset there. And then fast forward to 2014, this is a project called Deer Path, and this was a redevelopment of a project that, that Joe Hollander uh, originally built in, in 1979. And again, you can see that that handful of, of solar panels on top of one of the carports there. And again, this was this was kind of an early foray into um, putting solar onto onto multifamily for us. And then fast forward to 2016, um, 
We read about a project that was in our portfolio called Matia Court, and this is located in Buchanan, Michigan. This is a hundred unit uh, senior housing development uh, that, that's affordable for seniors living in Buchanan. And it was already an all electric site, but it was constructed in the seventies and, and it was an all electric site when all electric meant um, baseboard resistance, electric heat, and, and uh, the most inefficient way to, to do anything. So we, we went through and did a significant rehab here. Um, we put on what at the time was the largest solar array for multifamily, for residential multifamily in the state. And this was about 130 kilowatt uh, array system. And this project won um, something called the, the Michigan Battle of the Buildings for, for energy reduction and utility reduction um, in multifamily, as well as the, the Governor's Energy Excellence Award at the time. And then in 2019, um, we closed and began construction on the Creamery. This is a project located in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we, we did end up certifying it to lead platinum for homes. And this project had uh, about a 30, 35 kilowatt uh, array, uh, rooftop array. And this is an all electric building. Um, everything you see there, those are, are air source heat pumps. And, um, you know, again, the lead platinum, we're, we're, we're very proud of this building. It was, it was paired with, um, there's an affordable childcare center run by the YWCA of Kalamazoo located on our ground floor. And so the benefit for our residents of, of having an all electric building paired with, with on-site generation and the, the affordable child care has just, you know, really been hopefully a uh, significant impact to their lives and, and to the community. And that's, you know, what we really strive to do. And then fast forward to now, um, this is a project to be located in Kalamazoo. We are breaking ground in February. We, we've just cleared all of our MISHTA hurdles and, and been approved for kind of the final phase of our, our financing. So everything is a, is a green light here. Um, this is a rendering of a project. It's gonna be located on, on the north side of Kalamazoo, which is a, a historically disenfranchised neighborhood. Um, it was redlined during the 1930s and 40s and, you know, it was just has been economically disadvantaged ever since. And um, we are partnering with the local Baptist church in the neighborhood to, to redevelop the site. They owned all of this land and had a vision for, for what they wanted to see, which was housing that would be affordable for the seniors who, who are already living in the neighborhood. So here we have two buildings. There's, there's a north and a south building. And this is actually backwards. On, on the bottom of the screen is, is facing north. Um, our northernmost building will be certified to, to passive house or, or FIAS for anybody who, who might be familiar with that standard. And um, both of these buildings are all electric. We are planning to generate as much electricity on that northern building um, annually as we are using in a year. So, so we're planning to offset that. And um, we are certifying to uh, passive house, NGBS, Energy Star, Zero Energy Ready Homes. And the Southern building is essentially the same, except we are not seeking the passive house certification um, just because the, the we're using two different, slightly different sources of funding between the two and, and we're not required to certify on that one, but um, the, the solar generation is comparable. So on the Northern building, we have a, and, and I think I can, yeah. Oh, this was a rendering before we went to the flat roof. So this one shows solar on the roofs, but doesn't show the appropriate amount. This one shows the proper roofs, but but doesn't show any of the solar. And by the way, the parking vastly underestimates how much solar there is actually going to be. The entire parking lot is about to be covered in in um, solar carports, but I'll, I'll I'll get into that. So these are the sizes of the systems that that we're putting into place. Um, on the northern building, we have an 81.81 .81 kilowatt array and 85.02 on the solar carports. Um, we're putting it in the exact same carport system on the southern building in the parking lot, and then a slightly smaller rooftop array because the southern building is a smaller building. Um, for a total between the two buildings of 312 kilowatt uh, array, and I, I put our costs in there. I, I wasn't, and I apologize, I wasn't exactly sure who the audience here would be, um, but we are, 
you know, part of our, our development process with um, affordable housing is that we specialize, we specialize in tax credits as kind of a, a centerpiece of our business model. So we use something called the low income housing tax credit to offset the cost of construction for, for affordable housing. And the Inflation Reduction Act um, had a provision in there where it paired uh, investment tax credits, solar investment tax credits with low income housing tax credits so that you are now eligible to double dip if you are putting a solar array onto an affordable housing project. This is really good. You know, it's meant to incentivize developers who, who maybe are not already, you know, doing what they should be doing. But for those of us who, who were already interested in solar and already putting it in, this is, is just kind of icing on, on top. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So between the two, um, and, and we have two different financing structures. Our northern building uses something called the 9% tax credit versus the, the southern building, which is, uses the 4%. But you know your kind of standard investment tax credit offset for, for a commercial building or, or a commercial residential multifamily would be 30% on those solar arrays. So on, on both of those systems, we're essentially getting a 30% discount. And if anybody does the math on these, you might see it's less than 30%. The reason for that is that our investors who are, who are purchasing the tax credits from us generally give us about 90 cents on the dollar for those tax credits. So, so that math is gonna pencil out a little differently. But because these are affordable housing using the low income housing tax credit, in addition to the 30%, the US Department of Energy has a bonus energy tax credit program um, boosting that up to 20% of, of the eligible basis on that solar system. So between that 30 and 20, we're now at a 50% tax credit on our initial costs. And then we also get to stack the, the low income housing tax credits on top of that. What you see on our Northern building is that we're actually at a net negative cost on the northern building and our southern building, our cost for, for that you know 146 kilowatt array is, is just shy of $70,000. Bringing the net cost between the two to, to a negative cost, we're basically getting paid almost $200,000 to put in what will be you know, a, a really a life-changing array for the residents who live there because it will eliminate their utility costs. So, it, you know, from our perspective, this is a win-win-win kind of, you know, once in a career kind of opportunity, but we're, we're very pleased with, with how it's going. We have been approved that the, the bonus energy tax credits are um, not a given. You have to apply for those, but, but we have already been approved for, for those credits on both buildings and, um, we are through the design phase with our architect and engineering and everybody's kind of ready to go. So, so, you know, this system really seems to be penciling out in, in just uh, very advantageous and, and, you know, hopefully will, will result in an amazing outcome for the residents of the neighborhood. And, you know, that's, that's about it for, for my presentation part. So, I'm happy to turn it over for, for questions. I imagine there's there's many. Before I do, I just want to remind everybody, I was telling John before this meeting, um, I'm probably not your typical host on, on one of these meetings because on my team, I'm I'm the finance person more than I am the sustainability person. So so there's a lot of the technical side of things that I probably don't understand, but I will do my best to answer any questions or or be honest with you when I don't know the answers. Hey, uh, uh, thanks, Jason. And I think John's got the first question. Uh, Jason, why don't you stop the screen sharing? Yeah, um, easier, easier for us to kind of see things, to see the folks. Uh, go ahead, John. Jason, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. I'm assuming that John will share the slides with everybody. So could this formula or model work for a mobile home park in terms of utilizing some of the tax credits for housing and for, I mean, I think solar, it's, it's clear it can apply to that, but what about the other stuff? Can we stack it for a mobile home park? So I think the short answer to that is no. And, and the reason for that is because the low income housing tax credit um, already excludes mobile home 
parks from from being utilized for that credit. Essentially, when you use the the low income housing tax credit, you are compelled to to build a structure that that is going to preserve affordability for no less than forty five years. And I, I think that's just been too difficult for for mobile homes to to demonstrate. Hey, Jason, you. uh, if you, uh, you've got quite a bit of experience there with uh, the solar uh, carports and, and also obviously the uh, the roof uh, the systems, are the solar carports significantly more expensive? What's kind of the relationship between the two types of uh, applications? They are significantly more expensive. Um, so I worked it out. I guess I didn't save my, my math there, but I can pull up that slide again. The solar carports, I think, so my average cost per watt is about 365. And if I recall correctly, I think the rooftop, the average cost on, on this system was about 250. So that would make the, the solar carports, you know, around 450 or so a watt. And, and okay. it, you know, wow. so they were significantly more expensive. And, and from a for, you know, from a, a straightforward um, kind of business choice, they might not have made sense were it not for the fact that, that you know, our, our space for the development is constrained. You know, we can't really go off site for additional production and, and um, going for that, that net zero ready and, and offsetting all of the electric use was, was a goal of ours from the get go. So. What what was your experience with, uh, uh, you know, the city with respect to uh, inspections and, and your utility with respect to the interconnection issues? Yeah. Uh, so was that, was that a good experience or so so or? <laughs> so and and I want to apologize because again I would say Matt is is more of the person who who gets into the trenches on a lot of that stuff, but um, I've been involved on both sides and. I would say so-so with the utility. Um, you know, a lot of it is is a pushback on the size of the array. Um, you know, being able to demonstrate that we're actually going to use as much electricity because they don't. They obviously don't want us pushing back into the grid. Um, and um, we didn't really have issues on this one with the, with the city. Um, you know, I think based on what we'd already done in the city of Kalamazoo with the creamery, which was the project I demonstrated before that, um, you know, I think they kind of knew that that we could deliver um, and that it wouldn't be problematic. But but I would say the utility, there was some pushback on the sizing. It, it has not been a major pain point. Um, one of the other issues that we run into, and again, I, I don't know that this would be much of a concern for many of the people here, is is with the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, or MISHTA, because MISHTA ultimately underwrites our entire financing package for these these entire developments. And what as part of that, MISHTA um, takes a very conservative approach when a developer like us comes in and says, hey, we're going to offset all of the electric usage on our project. They say, yeah, right. We still want you to underwrite, you know, average utility costs. And they mean average from their entire portfolio of projects, which are 50 years old. And we're thinking, are you crazy? You want us to underwrite a utility bill? we're building a passive house building here in the first place. And yeah, but so, so, you know, without throwing too much shade, that has been a, a back and forth between our organization and MISTA for, for the better part of the past 10 years. I will say over the past two or three years, um, they have started to come around to the idea, but, but we're not there all the way. Glad you're making some progress. Uh, Dale, go ahead. So with what you were just talking about there, I didn't, um, follow that exactly. What do you mean they're requiring you to underwrite the the typical utility cost? So Mishta is involved in the financing of, of our bricks and mortar. And because of that, um, you know, they want to take a look at our, our projected operating costs of the entire system, of the entire building holistically. So, you know, we, we will collect rents and then subtract out all of our operating costs. And whatever's left is is what we can use to to pay for a mortgage. Um, 
the way MISTA usually does that is, is they project utility costs as part of your operating costs, and they want you to subtract you know, that amount of utility costs per unit out of your, your operating or your net operating income that's available to pay that, that mortgage. So on a unit, on a building like, like this one, they want us to subtract about a hundred dollars per month per unit out of our cash flow to cover the cost of electricity. And we have to tell them that's ridiculous because there's, even if, even if they, they, you know, weren't offset by the solar, these units would never use that that amount of electricity on a one bedroom. Comparably, we we did the study on our creamery project, the the lead platinum building here in Kalamazoo, and you know our average utility cost per unit um, before any solar offset is only about sixty dollars per month, um, you know, averaged over a year. So, and and again, that's that's before a solar offset, and with with a three hundred kilowatt array that we're putting in at at the Legacy, you know, it, we just find it ridiculous that Mishta will not give us more of a benefit of the doubt on uh, just so what kind it, of a reduction that would. So the effect of that is that they try to reduce how much money you can borrow to build the thing? Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think I understand. <laughs> so I had two other questions. Um, on, on the sheet that showed your numbers there, um, how, and the, the, the dollars per watt that you mentioned earlier seemed totally appropriate to me in terms of being reasonable. What, because the, the total, the, the ending value is negative or the ending cost is negative. What prevents someone from just being like, Oh, I'm going to install as much as I can on this system, even if I don't really need it because it's free money. Is there some limit to that? Like how, so there's a couple mechanisms. One, and I apologize, I think the way I presented it was was a little simplified because from our perspective, um, we probably were looking more for, for a break even and we probably will not ultimately claim that, that negative amount. Um, and the reason for that is because those 9% tax credits, which were generating the majority of that offset is on, on the one building we had the $70,000 cost, the other was, was the negative. The one that was negative uses something called the 9% low income housing tax credit. That is a finite resource and it is extremely competitive. So our organization has had a very high success rate of, of applying for and receiving those credits, but, but industry wide, um, the success rate for getting those credits is typically around 20%. And one of the ways that you get those credits is, is through showing something that the Mishnah calls credit efficiency, which is basically spreading them out as far as you can and, and not wasting them. And, you know, Mishnah's aim is, is at creating housing, not at, not at creating green housing necessarily. So, you know, we are aware that if we go too far, Mishnah will slap our hands and, and kind of penalize us on future applications. So, so we have an incentive, one, to not be greedy with it there. But the other issue um, is the utilities are going to push back. If, if we try to just, you know, if we had unlimited land and, and could build a giant array and, and print millions of dollars, the utilities are going to say, where's all this electricity going to go? Because you're not going to use it on site. Um, and, and they wouldn't approve our system either. So. Okay. All right. I probably, so then my last question was how on these uh, apartment complexes, is it the, the owner pays the whole one utility bill and the residents, it's just in their rent? These are great questions, Dale. Um, they vary. So, and then so how is it metered? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to give a multi-part answer to that because first I want to talk about the creamery, which is the one that, that is up and running in Kalamazoo. Um, that project is individually metered and residents pay their own utilities. Um, trying to think if there's an easy way to, to do this without getting into the weeds. So if somebody lives in, in an affordable housing development that was financed with the low income housing tax credit, uh, as the owner, we are restricted on what we can charge for rent to a maximum of 30% of their income. And their income cannot be more than 60% of the area median income to qualify to live there. 
Now the 30% that we're allowed to charge for rent, from that we have to deduct uh, a utility allowance. And Mishta publishes those allowance based on local averages. Um, so for a project like the Creamery, how that works is, you know, say, say, and some of our units are 30% units that start around $350 a month. So say the maximum housing cost that we're allowed to charge is, is $400 a month. Mishta would say, well, okay, our housing allowance from the utility rate sheet says that you need to subtract $100 as a utility allowance. So the most you can charge them for rent then is $300 per month plus the $100 utility allowance. Now they're at $400. Even though they're paying their own utilities, so they're only at $60, $62 a month on actual utility costs. So to them, it's just they they end up paying that $362 instead of the $400. So moving forward, because Mishta doesn't like to believe us on the cost savings on the front end, um, for the legacy, for the project we're building, we're going to, to single meter and we're going to project paid or, or owner paid utilities where um, we will pay 100% of utility costs and the residents will not, they'll just pay a, a straight rent and they will not have to worry about a, a utility allowance and, and we won't have to prove to Mishra that the savings are real because ultimately they'll just be going um, as, as the utility payer will be the, the primary beneficiary or the direct beneficiary of the savings or the reduction in, in costs. So then how does um, uh, how does it work with the utility? It probably would depend on every one of these you build might be in a different utility. Some of them are a Municipal, some of them are consumers. Right. How how do how does uh, I guess the complex the owner of the complex gets compensated by the utility for outflow? Correct, and and both of these projects that would have any significant outflow are are with consumers, and consumers currently is paying us. I think the average, I if I recall it correctly from last year, uh, consumers was paying us about nine point five cents. Uh, per kilowatt hour uh, that we were feeding into the grid while charging us about 19.5 for, for everything that was going the other way. So, um, you know, it, it not not exactly the best deal. And, and for anybody kind of following along, because we are not planning to do any on-site storage. So when we talk about offsetting 100% of the electric, electric use um, that we generate, you know, it will not be while it's used. So, so we know that we will be drawing from the grid. We know that we will have a utility cost. And the way that we actually underwrote that was just assuming that we're paying full retail for 100% of the electricity we use, and we're receiving only that that discounted rate for 100% of the electricity we generate. We know that that the reality will be better than that for us because obviously we're going to use plenty of it before it ever goes back into the grid. But for us to be conservative in our projections, that's that's how we did that. Did you attempt at all to pencil in battery storage since a 30% would apply to that as well? We, we did. We had a few constraints for battery storage. Um, one, um, just availability at, at the capacity we were looking at. But but honestly, one of the, the bigger constraints we had was um, in our in our building design, we had no place to, to put it. Um, you know, we... we Ultimately, it ultimately it was probably cost prohibitive because of of um, you know our lack of willingness to to over utilize the, the tax credits, um, but we never got very far down the cost side because we couldn't make the the building logistics and design work. Okay, John Richter, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a hypothetical question. And from what you're saying, I understand why you wouldn't want to do this. But if you had wanted to do this, could you have a single meter to the utility just as you're doing here, right? The owner would pay the utility. The owner would get the credit. Um, but sub-meter the uh, residents and have them pay you as the owner for the electricity that they use? Um. As I'm, I'm fairly certain the answer to that is no. I'm fairly certain there are some rules um, between either Misha and the tax credits. So once 
once we enter into tax credit housing, we're governed by something called a land use regulatory agreement. And that has ultimate jurisdiction over pretty much any financial transaction between us and the residents. And there's only a handful of, of things that we're allowed to charge for at that point. And I'm, I'm pretty sure submetered utilities would, would trigger somebody's defense system. Um, but I don't know, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I, I'd be confident the answer is we couldn't do it. And, and, and as the owner, you're also providing heat? Correct. And you can't charge them for that either. Correct. I mean, we could okay. we could make them pay themselves if they were utility metered, but under under this system, we we couldn't charge them for that. Understood. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, uh, Jason, have you been uh, using air source heat pumps for quite a while in different projects? And what's your experience been with the heat pumps? Has that been positive or? Overall positive. We we first put in air source heat pumps in that project in Buchanan, the 100 unit senior uh, redevelopment that had the the um, baseboard electric resistance heaters before, and those were that was our first foray into it. It was uh, th these Fujitsu mini split systems. And overall, I, I would say that was positive. But at that particular project. Um, there was a lot of resident training that had to happen in terms of temperature controls, understanding um, just how to set the temperature, how long it might take to, to heat or cool in response to, to what they were expecting. And um, that site had from, from the utility, not from the solar, that site had some, some dirty electricity or, or you know, it just wasn't... Uh, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. There were a lot of surges. And so mm -hmm. the first few years on that project, many we, our maintenance costs on those, those mini splits was significantly higher than we had projected because we had to replace several of them within the first few years. Um, we worked with the utility to, to, I don't know what they did in terms of their infrastructure improvements, but um, in terms of whatever was was frying those units, it, it did seem to be resolved because we haven't had any major issues there now in about three or four years. Um, the the rooftop units that that we have at the creamery, uh, that building opened in 2021, and so while it's still relatively new, we have had zero problems, um, never never a single complaint or or issue with with those units. So and that's what we're putting in on our new project as well. And have you found that, you know, in order to get the passive uh, uh, house certification, was there any part of that that was uh, challenging or was that uh, not, you know, was that very doable? Oh, no, it's it's quite challenging. And we've been very fortunate. And I'll, I'll give a plug. I don't know where everybody's from, but uh, we've been working with with AVB construction out of out of Kalamazoo and this is our first project with ABB. They're, they're you know, a, a very experienced and highly qualified general contractor, uh, but we had never worked with, with their organization before. And when we hired them for this project, you know, we made it really clear that, that we had, you know, we're focused on sustainability and our objective on this project was, was to go for passive house certification. And they sent their, their staff, their superintendent and, um, you know, vice president who's who's working on this project um, to get passive house certified on their side immediately. Um, and working with them, and then we've been working with Eco Achievers out of Detroit as our certifying agency, and working with our our architect and engineering firm, which is Abamar Spice, um, who who we did the creamery with, and who you know understands kind of what our objectives are, um, has been critical. To, to going down this this path. And of course, we're not certified yet. We haven't constructed the, the buildings, but um, everybody understands the assignment. And, you know, it's the same kind of, you know, achieving lead platinum was was also a, a challenge, but again, it was just so vital that, that really every part of the team understands um, what it is that we're, we're talking about, what it means for them and what the differences will be 
in terms of, of building penetrations and, and their, you know, their subcontractors and responsibility of just everybody who's, who's really going to touch the building um, to understand, you know, how critical it is that we, we know every hole that's drilled basically. Um, so, you know, we're, we're extremely optimistic. I'm, I'm feeling better, you know, passive house, for all intents and purposes, is is going to be harder than lead platinum. But going through that experience, I, I'm feeling like we're in better shape and more prepared for for what we're getting into um, than we've ever been. And so, you know, we're quite optimistic there. I will say, in terms of cost, um, you know, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison of what it would cost us to build the same building without the the passive house because you know, frankly, it would be designed a little differently and we would basically need to need to pay everybody extra to figure out what that design would look like so that we could figure out what it would cost. So the best we can kind of do is is some estimation on, on what the difference in cost has been. And it's somewhere probably between about a five to seven percent increase on, on the cost of the project um, to, to go to the passive house, which, you know, again, that, that negative $200,000 that I showed. One, I don't think we're actually going to claim it. Two, it's that amount is less than the cost of adding the passive house, but the, but the long-term operating costs and and frankly the additional borrowing capacity we get from from the reduction in utility costs does more than make, you know, even the short-term economic sense for us. Hey, John, John go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure how to articulate this, but now that the investment tax credit is in place for, I don't know, 10 years and some of the other tax credits are extended out, are you attempting to develop kind of a, a model approach to financing these types of developments? Or is it the reality in the real world is that every development is completely unique and so you don't, you really can't try and develop a model approach to these types of projects. Do you so a little column A, a little column B. Um, we are attempting to to create a model that that we can replicate. So the the, you know, the way that I laid it out to everybody, where where I show a negative cost or even just a, a significant reduction. You're at ultimately at 30% ITC and 20% um, bonus energy tax credit, and the LIHTC on top of that. It, it for for anybody who is a a LIHTC developer, which is its own industry, um, it should be a no brainer. You would think everybody would be doing this. Why why wouldn't we? It's it's you know they're giving away money to add solar, but the reality is. Um, the Department of Energy opened up that application round for the, the bonus credits, and it was the first round that they had done it, it was, and they opened it in November of, of last year. And the way that they handled it was they opened this application round and said, for the next 30 days, we're going to treat any application that's received as being received at the same time. And I think it ran from like November 18th to December 17th, if I recall. And so as long as you had your application in, by December 17th, everybody was on the same footing. And then anything that came after that was going to be treated as a first come, first serve. So, you know, anybody who's who's tried to apply for a federal program, much less a, a federal program that's not aimed at the general public, um, there's so much red tape and and you know, filling out these applications is is a real challenge. And doing it on something that's brand new, where where there's just not a lot of deep experience or, or anybody to turn to for for how you know to do this or that, it was not fun. Um, but so I submitted our application for these projects, and then the Department of Energy started reviewing our application over the subsequent months. And what I discovered throughout the review was that we it was it became really obvious, even though they didn't say it to me that we were, if not the only, we were certainly the first tax credit LIHTC project in the state of Michigan that had applied because they didn't understand what MISHTA's authority was. They didn't understand that MISHTA's tax credits were federal tax credits and not state tax credits. There were a number of things that the Department of Energy 
clearly did not understand from their lack of experience of on having dealt with with Mishta that led me to to the conclusion that oh I assumed everybody was going to be using this and instead I'm the only one using this right now I I do expect that you know as these projects come online and as the word gets out everybody else is going to catch up and and the 20% bonus tax credit is a finite resource you know that's that's capped in the inflation reduction act and i don't remember what what the numbers are there but eventually that is going to run out and you know there's only so much allocation per round and, and things of that nature so what as much as i would love to say that that we are building a model around using it um the reality is i i can't expect to get it every time and so you know i have to underwrite a project assuming that i'm not going to get it <clears> and then I do great you know it's gravy but one, one more follow-up have you thought about doing these projects in rural areas that are designated and you may be eligible for the reap grant or is that strictly for farmers but i think it applies to small business but does it apply to housing projects in rural areas you know, I'm not familiar with the REAP grant, but, but we do develop in rural areas as well. And, and USDA um, and RD have, have you know, specific funds for for rural developments. But as far as rural and, and green, um, we just haven't encountered it yet. Well, you ought to look into it. Again, I have no, yep. I don't know much about it, except that you can get a 50% grant for a solar project for farmers and I think small business that are located within rural parts of the state, which is quite a bit of the state once you get outside the metro areas. And we have a member, um, Ken Zabara, who's with Harvest Solar, and they do a lot of work with farmers and they, they're they experts at writing the proposals for these REAP grants on behalf of farmers and stuff. So it may be something to look into. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Hey, Jason, uh, how does the uh, the whole sustainability uh, renewable energy aspect uh, fit into uh, uh, reaching out to clients? Uh, you know, is that a, a big thing that you kind of mention or is it uh, not a, something that comes up? Uh, how, how does that play with respect to uh, your uh, uh, in your uh, residents? Yeah, well, and so I, I appreciate that you clarified uh, that you're asking about residents, but I, I do want to answer that. Man, I'm doing the politician thing. I, I, I want to answer your question, but it, it reminds me of other questions that I want you to ask. Okay, um, <laughs> go ahead. You can ask uh, yourself questions. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll answer that for residents, but also uh, I'll, I'll just open that up to say to all stakeholders beyond, beyond the residents. Um, right. Some of them don't care at all you know some of them don't even know couldn't tell you the the difference from one to the other and then others are extremely proud to, to live in a place that that you know is sustainable or more sustainable and and you know um i imagine uh, i imagine this audience feels the, the similar way. I, I, I won't make any assumptions. It's a large audience, but I will go back to, uh, you know, I think it was the 2020 presidential debates where one of the candidates, you know, brought up green construction and, and why he was not for it. And one of the things he said was, you know, you get these tiny little windows. And this is while we were under construction of, of the creamery, a lead platinum, you know, Kalamazoo County's only lead platinum building is, is what we have. And we've got some of the largest windows, you know, in the city. So, uh, you know, um, in terms of resident impact, um, ultimately, I, I think it's doing its job. It, it's creating a, a more comfortable environment, whether or not they know how it works or, or not. Um, you know, they're, they're getting the benefit. But when I say other stakeholders, you know, on, on that project in particular, we had two um, social impact investors. One was the Kalamazoo Community Foundation and the other was the Stryker Johnson Foundation. Stryker Pharmaceuticals 
Um, you know, they, they're the largest producer of hospital beds in the world and, and they make all kinds of other equipment. They're, they're based in Kalamazoo. And for anybody who, who's not familiar, you, you know, the Stryker family has, has a very large philanthropic interest in and around that community. Um, Kalamazoo is, is famously home to the Kalamazoo Promise for, for free, um, you know, graduate or undergraduate education for, for college for you know, any resident of Kalamazoo Public Schools uh, to attend any university in the state of, of Michigan, any public university. Um, so it's it's a huge benefit. And, and the Kalamazoo Promise was was anonymously funded, but there's only a handful of, of families in, in and around our community who, who could have pulled that off. So um, the but I thought Stryker pulled out of Kalamazoo and moved to New York after around the 2006 election. No, no, John Stryker, uh, I believe, lives in New York. Bill, Bill Johnson and Rhonda Stryker are still located in Kalamazoo, and the Stryker Corporation is is still headquartered in, in Portage, um, so they're they're still there. But um, for for the Creamery, uh, how that worked is is both the Stryker Johnson Foundation and the Kalamazoo Community Foundation each purchased one point two five million dollars in MISHTA housing bonds. Um, these are tax exempt bonds that, that MISHTA normally sells on the open market. And at the time they were selling them at about 3.45% interest rate uh, return. And how, how affordable housing finance would typically work is MISHTA would then add a spread of, of 1.5% interest rate spread on top of that 3.45 to give developers like me a, a 4.95% um, interest rate on a, on a mortgage for the affordable housing development. Well, the the Stryker Johnson Foundation and the Kalamazoo Community Foundation bought these bonds from MISHTA at a one percent rate, and then MISHTA passed you know their one point five percent on to us to give us a two point five percent interest rate on that portion of of our debt, and we were able to you know that gave us a blended interest rate on the project of about three point seven percent, which for that project yielded about an additional $900,000 in, in proceeds. Um, but the Stryker Johnson Foundation was very interested in the project's lead certification. And, you know, they, they had a strong interest in us seeing that through. So, and frankly, their involvement gave us a lot of cover when other stakeholders said, well, this, you know, you have cost overruns, you should kill the lead part and, you know, we can save some money. We can value engineer it out. It was our our ability to say, well, that's very important to our investors that we don't do that. Kind of gave us the cover to to you know be a bull and and just put our heads down and and keep moving forward. So you know um, some some stakeholders very much care about it, even if they don't live there, <laughs> ourselves included. Yeah, I'm, I'm disappointed that Mishta isn't more on board, considering the uh, our governor's uh, emphasis on uh, you know energy efficiency and renewables. But yeah. uh, and, and I am not meaning to throw Mishta under the bus. I don't want anybody to take that away. Mishta is is not that they're not more on board. They are just a very conservative, risk averse organization, and and. You know, frankly, most developers, developers, real estate developers, have a bad reputation. Um, we like to exploit loopholes and, and take advantage of, of opportunities. And so, you know, a lot of developers, I think, would, would you know, there's there's plenty of good reason why Mishra is the way that they are and why they're slow to, to incentivize programs. It's just, it is unfortunate. Um, I will say that the governor's involvement has been extremely positive and, um, you know, the governor actually came to the creamery and did a press conference when we opened the child care center there. So, you know, we, we're extremely, extremely happy with them on that. And it was the governor's office and Mishta who put us in contact with Michigan State University um, to start exploring mass timber construction, which is is the development type or, or construction type we're using for one of our future developments in Battle Creek, um, which will be comparable to to the one we've been talking about here today in terms of sustainability and certifications. And how many projects do you do uh, every year or every two years? I mean, are you doing 
one project a year or every other year? Or how, how does that work? Well, we're growing. So historically, we've averaged about one project a year. Um, lately, we've been applying for somewhere between and, and receiving awards for somewhere between two and four projects per year. Um, but these are all in various stages of, of development and we're we're hiring additional uh, capacity to help us help us get them closed and, and constructed. But, um, you know, I'd say Matt and I both, we spent several years kind of honing our craft before we were comfortable trying to, uh, trying to bite off even more, but, but now we're there. Yeah, well, and you may have answered this question already. Have, have you run into any issues with, uh uh contractors or others having a hard time dealing with maybe new standards new requirements is that because been an issue or is that worked pretty smoothly i wouldn't say it's been smooth and and you know different contractors are different we we had a team we worked with um prior to switching to avb and um it's not that anybody was resistant to to doing what needed to be done, but there was a level of capacity and frankly of competence that that is required to to pull off you know some some of this some of the stuff is is not for the faint of heart. And um, regardless of whether or not you know that people want to do it, there there is a capacity issue. Right, yeah. Well, it's seven fifty-one. We probably have time for another question. Does anybody have a, a comment or question uh, uh, for Jason? Um, uh, John, do you have any announcements you want to make? Well, sure. There's always room for announcements. Um, <laughs> we're having a fundraiser at John Sarver's house Saturday night in East Lansing. Um, you know, I think all of you have gotten little emails about it. I'm going to send another one out tomorrow to the whole membership. But if you if you're interested in joining us at five o'clock on Saturday at John's house, he's serving food and drinks and it'll be an opportunity to visit with each other. And it's a fundraiser for the organization. And uh, Senator Sam Singh hopefully will stop by to visit. Um, yeah, and Senator Singh quite... has been a key person in kind of promoting energy legislation uh, oh yeah right. he was the, he was the the major straw that stirred the drink in the senate absolutely um i have one more question for jason though i mean you know there's a whole lot of talk about electrification and the fact that the housing stock in michigan is pretty old and it's but it's 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 going to be around have you explored efforts to try and do rehabbing? I know you focus on multifamily, but is there any interest in doing single family where there's rehab in terms of net, not well, more passive and electrification, or is that, or is that viewed as kind of a separate niche that deserves its own focus? So one, it, 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 I think it entirely is viewed typically as a separate niche. Um, but switching hats a little bit, I, I serve on the local advisory board for, for LISC of Kalamazoo, which is the local initiative support corporation, uh, a community development financial institution. And one of the things that LISC is, is very focused on right now, um, you know, is a, they're, they're one of the recipients of, of greenhouse gas reduction funding um, along with with um, in Michigan I can't remember what the what the tranche is called but um, an organization called Michigan saves um, which I expect many of you may be familiar with um, you know many people are interested in tackling that that single family rehabs and and electrification and trying to get resources freed up um, and low cost, you know, low interest financing tools available to, to homeowners and, and even renters um, to, to initiate these, these kinds of projects. I guess, I, I guess we should have asked this question earlier. Are you putting electric chargers into these, to this new the legacy in case of vehicle chargers? chargers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we're putting level, I think on the legacy, we're putting level two chargers 
Level, I'm sorry, this is where I get out of my wheelhouse. Level, what's the most, I think level three is where we get incentivized. So we're, we're putting in level two and level three on that one. And then at the, the creamery, we have, um, I guess it'd be level two chargers. And we have them at a couple other sites um, on our portfolio. And I, I should do a plug. I can't remember the name of the organization, but um, we work, we're working with a nonprofit uh, who has an electrical ve electric vehicle car share um, the creamery was the, the pilot site for it in the nation. And then our other project in, in Portage Spring Manor is, is the second site where um, not even residents and anybody can, can rent an electric vehicle that they have an app and it benefits our residents. It's in our parking lot, um, but anybody can rent it. And it's $5 an hour or $50 a day um, to rent. It's a Chevy Bolt at, at both both facilities but we've been extremely pleased with that program because you know not all of our not all of our residents have cars or, nor need them very often so yeah that's a that's a neat aspect of the what you've been doing uh to have the car share with the evs that's neat yeah apologies that i didn't think about it sooner and and um i really wish i, I would have done my homework and, and remember the name of the organization that we're working with on that to, to give them the plug well i think this has been fascinating and i think we'll just have to have you come back um in a you know several months from now and because i think because i think that glrea would would we as we build new relationships we're always trying to be supportive of work of cutting edge work and clearly what you're doing is on the cutting edge and it's truly inspiring what you're trying to do um and uh so we hope you come back and we can learn from each other as we move forward thank yeah, you th thank you both yeah. yeah jason thank you very much it's been a very uh informative presentation and lots of good information and uh this may be obvious but we're not going to have a program next thursday because it's halloween so uh the week after uh, Halloween, uh, Ann Arbor Solar Stories will uh, uh, be on the agenda again. But thank you, everybody, for uh, coming. And uh, again, Jason, thanks for uh, a great presentation. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Truly. Everybody have a good weekend. Take care.